In this video, I shall be talking about acute rheumatic fever. This is the part one of the video. It is very important. Why? Because acute rheumatic fever is a very important long case in the exam. You see, long cases are mainly from two organ systems, CVS and CNS. And acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease are important long cases for the exam. Besides this, you also get to encounter cases on and off. And the IAP has recently come up with the guidelines also. But prior to moving on to the guidelines and learning about that, first you must have an idea about what is rheumatic fever, what is rheumatism, and the various criteria which have come over the ages. Some uh, examiners are very interested in knowing all that. So basically, the word rheumatic is something which is related to joints and connective tissue. That you must be very clear. That is why the field of rheumatology and uh, rheumatic is the term which is used. It is a systemic disorder. It is an immunologically mediated disease and it occurs after an infection with group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. So these three things you must know by heart and you must understand this. Next, it is preceded by usually by sore throat, generally by two to three weeks, but the range is from one to five weeks. The peak incidence is between 5 to 15 years of age, so it is mainly a pediatric disease. That is why it forms a very important long case. And it is very rare in children who are less than 4 year old and more than 40 years of age. So basically, the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus has a cell wall which has three layers. The first layer is of the capsule, the main component of which is hyaluronic acid. And it has cross reactivity with the joints of human system. Next layer is that of the cell wall, which has the main antigen, the M protein, and it cross reacts with the myocardium. And the innermost layer is the group carbohydrate, which has two important antigens, the rhamnose and N acetyl glucosamine, which cross react with the valves. So you, three, you see the symptoms are mainly of the joints and the heart. In heart, there is pancarditis, which we'll see later further. But myocardium and heart valves have a major cross reactivity with the group A beta hemolytic streptococcal cell wall. The agent factors are the M types of bacteria, that is M type 1, 3, 5, 6, 18, and 24. Even though IAP mentioned certain other M types like 19, 27, and 29. And why is it known as M type? Because they are characterized by the formation of highly M, that is mucoid colonies. Then there is genetic predisposition. Monozygotic twins are affected more than dizygotic twins. And the various polymorphisms are also responsible. And poverty and crowding are certain environmental factors which predispose to a child developing acute rheumatic fever. Now coming on to the various diagnostic criteria. You see, the diagnostic criteria originally given was the Jones criteria. It was given by Thomas Duckett Jones in the year 1944. It was updated in the year 1992 by the American Heart Association. And this is the one which we had studied in our residency. And it was finally, it has been finally revised by American Heart Association again in the year 2015. We see what all has occurred in all these things. But between 1944 to 1992, the Jones criteria was revised in 1955 again and evidence of group A streptococcal infection for the diagnosis was made mandatory in this year. It was modified in 1965 when the criteria of arthralgia, arthralgia was changed to the criteria of polyarthritis as one of the major criteria and it was tinkered with in 1984 when the minor criteria was reduced to two clinical and two lab criteria. But whatever be the revisions or modifications, basic principles and general framework of the original criteria remained intact throughout. So Jones, the original criteria which was given in 1944 by Jones, he classified the criteria as major and minor and he said that a combination of major or one major and two minor would seem to place the diagnosis of rheumatic fever on reasonably safe grounds. He did, he did not say that it is sure that the patient will have rheumatic fever if this criteria is met. But yes, 
a very very high probability would then there be at that time itself he had predicted the changes in criteria would likely continue to occur even over the next few decades unless a highly sensitive and specific test obviates the need for reliance on the various clinical criteria then updated jones criteria in 1992 it limited the application of this jones criteria to the first attack of rheumatic fever only so by using this criteria you should you were not able to make the diagnosis of rheumatic fever if it recurred in a patient now finally there is the revised jones criteria in the year 2015 and it has four major qualities four major differences the first thing is that it defines high risk and low risk populations separately as we'll see later second it recognizes the variability in clinical presentation in high and low risk populations high risk populations are those in which the incidence prevalence of rheumatic fever is very high and low risk populations are those in which the incidence prevalence of rheumatic fever is not that high now the variability in clinical presentation can be understood as for example monoarthritis or polyarthralgia can now be considered as a criterion for arthritis in low risk populations compared with the 1992 version where there was no separation of low risk and high risk populations and only polyarthritis was to be considered as the major criteria for diagnosis then the revised jones criteria includes doppler echocardiography echocardiography is a newly uh, come up investigation much after 1992 so it has included doppler echocardiography as a tool to diagnose subclinical carditis that is carditis which has not produced any symptoms yet in the patient and finally these revision this revised criteria brings the criteria in closer alignment with various other international criteria which have been meant for the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever so you see that low risk populations are those in which the incidence of acute rheumatic fever is less than equal to 2 per 100000 school going children or the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease is less than equal to 1 per 1000 population per year and moderate to high risk populations are those in which the incidence of acute rheumatic fever is more than 2 per 100000 school going children or the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease is more than 1 per 1000 population per year the five major criteria carditis arthritis chorea rhythm marginitum and subcutaneous nodules carditis criteria remains the same in both the types of populations it can be either clinical and or subclinical carditis subclinical carditis we know requires an echocardiographic evidence and that is in the form of echocardiographic valvulitis the arthritis in low risk populations needs to be polyarthritis whereas in moderate to high risk populations monoarthritis or polyarthritis or even polyarthralgia can be considered as a criteria then chorea erythema marginatum and subcutaneous nodules remain the same in both kinds of population as regards minor criteria i have highlighted the changes in red in low risk populations polyarthralgia needs to be considered whereas in moderate to high risk populations monoarthralgia fever more than equal to 38.5 degree centigrade in low risk populations whereas more than equal to 38 in moderate to high risk esr more than equal to 60 mm in first hour and or crp more than equal to 3 whereas in low risk populations whereas in moderate to high risk populations the corresponding values are more than equal to 30 and more than equal to 3 prolonged pr interval remains the same in both these criteria both these populations also a supportive evidence of antecedent group a streptococcal infection stays the same and it is, can be a positive throat culture or a rapid streptococcal antigen test or an elevated streptococcal antibody titer so you can have three things a positive culture or rapid streptococcal antigen test or streptococcal antibody titer elevated now the diagnosis of the first attack of acute rheumatic fever should be confirmed if there are two major or one major and two minor criteria in the individual along with an evidence for recent streptococcal infection and for the diagnosis of recurrent attacks of acute rheumatic fever you need to have two major or one major plus two minor or three minor criteria 
plus an evidence of recent streptococcal infection. Now this is very important which is often asked in the exam especially in the long cases and the many residents they don't know. So there are basically three exceptions to Jones criteria. First is chorea alone. If a child is presenting with only chorea and other causes of chorea have been excluded then acute rheumatic fever is considered to be the probable diagnosis. Then insidious onset or indolent carditis again with no other specific cause explaining the carditis. And third thing is some cases of recurrent attacks of rheumatic fever. So in these three cases that is chorea, indolent carditis and some cases of recurrent attacks you don't need the patient to fulfill the Jones criteria in entirety to diagnose him as having acute rheumatic fever. You can straight away label the child or the patient as having acute rheumatic fever. So this was the first part of the video. We will see the remaining part in the next video. Thank you so much for a patient watching and please do share the knowledge. Thanks a lot.